you'll have noticed that um, every week when I send out my email and a, a copy of the service sheet uh, for the coming Sunday, that I try to choose a picture um, which uh, is relevant to the theme of the day. And I've asked um, Philip just to show us again the picture that I chose for this week. Um, when Naomi saw this, she said, oh, I like that. And then she said to me, it looks like he's going swimming uh, or he's just been swimming. And it does, doesn't he? Like he's got his trunk and his tail uh, rolled up under his arm. What it is a picture of, uh, however, uh, is the man at the pool of Bethesda uh, who had laid there for many years and who Jesus healed. And this is a picture of Jesus saying to him, rise, take up your mats and walk. And that is the story we're looking at today as we turn to John chapter five. Thanks, Philip. Just to give you a little bit of background, Jesus has gone up to Jerusalem and he's gone to the pool of Bethesda. There is no mention of his disciples on this occasion, though we might assume that John at least is with him because it is John who has given us this story. Modern archeologists, have uncovered a pool in the north of Jerusalem with five porticos, just as it's described in John's gospel, which they confidently believe to be the very place where this miracle uh, happened, and which you can visit if you go to the Holy Land today. In fact, I think like so many of the uh, sites in the Holy Land, they've built a church over the top of it. But I mention that because it reminds us that what we are dealing with in the Bible is not legend or myth, but history. These are real places, real people, real things that happened. Well, what was special about this pool, the pool of Bethesda? To understand this fully, we need to look at verse four. But if you noticed in our reading, verse four was omitted. And that's because most translators of the Bible believe that it was a verse which was added later by the commentators and not by John himself. So they leave it out. But in fact, it helps us to understand uh, the story. If we read the story with that verse inserted, it goes like this. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, waiting for the stirring of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool, and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well from whatever disease that person had. So that's the, the background to this place. Uh, the water would bubble up every so often, which they believed uh, was uh, happening because of an angel of the Lord. And whoever would get into the water first would be healed of their disease. We're not told how often this happened or given any testimony from people who were healed. But clearly there was a belief that this pool had healing properties. And it says many people gathered there daily because of it. I was trying to think of a, a modern example, and the example I thought of, and which you might well think of as well, is Lourdes in the south of France. Did you know that Lourdes has the highest density of hotels anywhere in France outside of Paris? 
Why is that? Because it is a place visited by millions of people every year. People hoping to receive healing from God. And it all started back in 1868 when a peasant girl called Bernadette uh, came back to the village and said she had seen the Virgin Mary. Mary appeared to her, it said, on a number of occasions after this. And on one of those occasions, told her to dig a hole in the ground. And when she dug the hole, uh, she found a spring of water. And the thing people go to Lord's for today is to drink the water or to bathe in the water to find healing from God. And Wikipedia tells me that since 1868, over 200 million people have visited Lord's. How many miracles do you think have happened? How many people have been healed out of those 200 million? The official number is 69, 69. 69 attested miracles, healings uh, from cancer, paralysis, and blindness to name three. But it puts it in perspective, doesn't it? To think that all these people are traveling to Lourdes, but since 1868, just 69 attested miracles. We're not told in our Bible story how often people were healed at Bethesda, nor how many people over the years. What we are told is that there was a man who had been coming there for 38 years. 38 years. We're not told what was wrong with this man, but the implication is that he was paralyzed in some way. Because when Jesus asks him if he wants to get better, he says to Jesus, well, there's no one to help me into the water when the moment comes. Someone else always gets there first. That used to intrigue me as a boy. I used to think to myself, well, why doesn't he sit right on the edge of the pool? And as soon as he sees that water bubbling, he just tips himself in. There's no answer to that question. It's just how I imagined it uh, as a child. Maybe he didn't want to get better. I know that sounds uh, surprising, incredulous. But in fact, Jesus does ask him that question, doesn't he? Do you want uh, to get better? Do you want to get well? And it may be that he'd got so used to his life the way it was, that he feared any change. It's not quite the same thing, I know, but um, in Nairobi, where I lived for a long time, if you were disabled or maimed, um, it was a way uh, of um, getting money from people. You know, you could earn your living that way, as horrible as it seems. Uh, because people would take pity on uh, you as you begged on the street. Maybe this man didn't want to get better, but that's not actually what I think. Uh, because if he didn't want to get better, why would he come uh, every day for 38 years to this place of healing? Jesus looks at him and he says to him, stand up, take your mat and walk and that is exactly what the man did with a world with a word jesus healed a man who had been suffering for 38 years human suffering comes in many forms doesn't it when i was a curate many years ago a lady came to see me one day and she said that many years before that her daughter had been stillborn. And as was the way in those days, she had never been allowed to hold that child or even see that child. But that child had been taken away and she never got to see it. 
We checked our records in the church and we found the place uh, where in our graveyard the child had been buried. And all those years later, we held a small service uh, and put up a stone in memory of that child. That lady had hurt inside for years and years. But at last, I hope that she had some healing. Sometimes we do that. We carry our burdens for many years. Maybe this passage is telling us that God knows how we feel and he feels our pain too. There have been some reports on the BBC News over the past few weeks about young unmarried mothers who were forced, in effect, to give up their children for adoption. Again, without ever having seen them or having the chance to hold them. And the pain that they have carried all their lives is evident when you see those women interviewed, grieving for their lost child. Jesus has walked on this earth. He has shared the lives of human beings. He knows the pain we sometimes suffer. At the pool of Bethesda, he healed a man who had suffered for 38 years. The man took up his mat and he walked. It's at this point that John tells us it was the Sabbath day. Now, this would have hit any Jewish reader between the eyes because they would have known that the rabbi said it was unlawful to do any work on the Sabbath. For our benefit, John spells it out. The Jewish leaders, he says, said to the man who had been cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your mat on the Sabbath. They seem to have missed the joyous fact of this man's healing and the sign that God had come among them in the person of Jesus Christ. All they were worried about was the law. But did the law really forbid people from carrying a mat on the Sabbath? Did the law really forbid people from doing anything on the Sabbath? Surely the rabbis had overdone it. The gist of the fourth commandment to me is that we should have a day of rest from our labours, that we should take a break from our occupation, that we should have a day off from the work we do the rest of the week, but not that we are forbidden from doing anything at all. Maybe we'll look at the Sabbath day in more detail on another occasion. I want to sum up uh, the things I've been saying this morning. Firstly, this was the third sign that Jesus did, the third miracle that he performed. And like the ones before it, it was a sign pointing to who he was. John in his gospel is building up for us a picture for us uh, to understand who Jesus really was, that he was God in the flesh, because this was something this miracle that only God could do. It was a sign. It tells us that God is concerned with what concerns us, whether it's recent or long-standing. Jesus didn't heal everyone at the pool that day, but he healed this man. After 38 years of suffering, this man was made whole. And it may be that there's someone here or listening at home who has been suffering themselves, maybe for many years, maybe with something recently. If you're in church today, I'm going to offer you the opportunity to pray with me in the chancel after the service. If there's something uh, that's worrying you, that's on your heart or mind, um, you can come up to the chancel, um, 
privately and pray with me after the service. So I won't be at the back of the church to say goodbye to everyone today, um, but you'll understand uh, that I'll be praying at the front. Do take the opportunity to come and pray with me if there is anything that is worrying you today. And then lastly, in this passage, we learn something about the Sabbath day. Uh, we're reminded that while God calls us to make special use of the Sabbath day, it is also true that, as Jesus said on another occasion, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And God's work of care for his world and for all of us doesn't stop just because it's a Sunday. bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for this story which reminds us of your concern for human suffering and of your compassion for us. We pray that you would be with those who are suffering today and give them your peace. For we ask it in your name. Amen.